Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, authorities, panelists, representatives of the energy sector. It is a pleasure to greet you and welcome you on behalf of OLADE, the Ministry of Industry, Energy and Mining of Uruguay, the INTB, and the first Irene Investments Fund. We give you a warm welcome to this panel on hydropower. It is an honor for all the organizations that are part of this event to join in this city of Montevideo, Uruguay. We would like to thank all of our main sponsors. We want to thank the institutions and the media partners who have supported us and collaborated in this eighth Energy Week and in the first Investment Forum for Energy Transition in Latin America. This event is focused on crucial matters such as energy safety, renewables, energy transitions, and so on. We have had a full agenda in the past two days where we had keynote speeches of such as the one of President Bachelet on gender, or yesterday's panels where we had ample opportunities to talk about the opportunities that the region has for using green hydrogen. Today we will have a high-level panel, and I believe is the most important panel in the event. Not because I'm here, but I'm going to say it's the most important one anyway. And we will have a debate about the importance of hydropower generation for the energy mixes of the region. And we will also identify obstacles for its development within a global context. Today, the hydropower stations of the region are a reliable, renewable, and affordable source of energy, and they are a testament to political coordination and to the efforts of all countries, and they are a factor for regional integration in terms of energy. And as a matter of fact, this year is the 50th anniversary of OLEADE, as is the 50th anniversary of the Itaipu Treaty. And it was generated 40 years ago. Less than 10 years ago, hydropower represented, at the global level, over 50% of the renewable power installed. And for decades, this allowed people to millions of people to have access to clean energy and Latin American countries were no exception to this. However, we are reaching a distribution of thirds, where hydropower is a third, wind power is a third, and solar power is one third, with a contribution of biomass as well. So we want to take advantage of the expertise of panelists to discuss the benefits of hydropower and see what we need in order to make progress and tackle new projects because we consider this is a key technology given its great capacity, its terms for amortization, and the amount of carbon dioxide emissions that can be avoided by using them. Having said this, I want to invite the panelists that will be joining us. I want to invite Enio Verri, General Director of Itaipu, a position he has held since March 2023. He is an economist with a bachelor's degree from the State University of Maringa and a master's degree in economics from the same university. And he has a PhD in Latin American integration from the University of Sao Paulo. He is a retired professor of the economics department of the university. He is a former secretary of finance and former chief of staff of the Ministry of Planning, Budget, and Management of Brazil. And he was elected state deputy of the state of Panama twice. And he was also a federal deputy for that same state. 
I also want to invite Gabriel Sardi, General Manage Manager of Salto Grande in Uruguay. He's an industrial engineer from University of the Republic, and he has over 30 years of experience in the generation of electricity generation. He worked in UTE in different roles, and in 2016, he joined Salto Grande as a renovation projects manager. And since last year, he has been acting as the general manager. And last but not least, I want to invite Cecilia Correa to the panel. She's a sector specialist of the Energy Division of the Inter-American Development Bank and is responsible for the bank's sector portfolio in Uruguay. She is a mechanical and industrial engineer, graduated from the School of Engineering of the University of the Republic of Uruguay, and holds a master's degree in energy systems from the University of Melbourne. She has over 10 years of experience in the energy sector, where she has worked in several projects that seek to implement new technologies for the energy transition, such as sustainable mobility and green hydrogen. And she is also a gender specialist for Uruguay. So without further ado, I want to open up the panel for discussion. And I want to talk about the first topic that I would like to discuss today, which is the role of hydropower in the energy mixes of the region and the role that they have in general for the energy transition. So let us begin with Enyo, and I will now sit with you. Thank you, everyone. It is a great pleasure. We have Philip Sosa, the president and a colleague from Paraguay, our brothers from Paraguay, who I always repeat, when I speak about Itapu, I speak about Brazil. But Brazil only has 50% of Itapu. Now, also, we have our partners from Paraguay involved. Regarding this, regarding hydropower, the challenge that we have right now <clears throat> is very important. It's important to see a paradox that we have. We are trendy. Hydropower is trendy because everybody's talking about this contaminating energy, oil, carbon, and this is widely used around the world. So we use these countries, we use these very much. There are countries in Europe that totally depend on atomic energy. And in Brazil and in Latin America, I want to highlight a seminar in which I participated last week with Africa, where Africa also has a great potential. So the other countries, the underdeveloped countries, have an energy potential at a time when humanity is claiming to stop using the other energies. <clears throat> so we have a great challenge before us. So where's the paradox? We have at the same time with humanity, which is very concerned about the energy we are using, it's also concerned about the environment. And environmental issues have to do with what kind of central, what kind of plants will we be using. There's no doubt that Itaipu, never more, never again. Uh, we will never again have another Itaipu. We will never build it as it was built before. <clears throat> and we had a whole lot of impacts on the environment and also social impacts. Uh, the other big centrals, uh, hydropower centrals that we have in Brazil do not use water filters. And that's good because there's no environmental impact. But now in the Amazon, with the big drought that we are having, they produce 20% of what they could produce. So it's important to understand that we have only one alternative. But undoubtedly, I am convinced that hydropower is the best option that we have regarding the environment and social aspects. And this is something that we can do. We can grow with this. We have the conditions within the region. If we, we've analyzed this in Olade, we need to have a lot of policies so that our movement can grow. Now I'm looking outside of Brazil. All of us have, all of us have, have a lot of water. So what we need is to have a good discussion with society and to say, see what we want, because it's us. 
it's not us that lead everything, but what's the limit regarding cost and benefit? What can we do? How can we move forward? And another interesting thing, which is also an interesting discussion, and one of my tasks as general director of Itaipu is to see how we can use integration policies in this hydropower policy. This is essential. We have the capacity to produce, but it's only valuable when we produce. And in fact, we cannot leave that energy capacity aside. We can build, there are limits, but we can move forward, we can grow. And the potential on its own is worth nothing. So now we have to do research, we have to look at the external sectors of our country. They need to make research, they need to use more of this energy. So this is apart from public management, the state model that we want. So integration and financing capacity is important. Okay, I'll give you the floor. But how do we do this? In the case of Itaipu, what we finance, what we resolve, we have other investments that we will be seeing shortly. But we have to think about how the countries of the region that have a very big potential to produce energy, energy that the world has its eyes on, and we, better than anyone, have the technological facilities to do this, to integrate this and finance this. So again, we have IDB, we have CAF, we have the case of Brazil, we have the BRIC also, where there are many countries that participate and who are partners, and they are banks, they can create funds and give mutual support, and also expand our capacity, because this topic that we are discussing, we will talk more about this later, but this is the key topic. We are reducing the percentage that we have together in the economy of production. We can expand our share. We can, because we have the potential to produce, but the real demand for this type of energy that we produce seems, this, that seems to be the question. So there was an introductory analysis because we have the product that's good, it's necessary, the world needs it, we have technology. Last Friday, we received a committee with three very important authorities from China. Lucho was with me. And all the team, all the CEOs were there. And they started the meeting by thanking Itaipu. And I said, why are they thanking Itaipu? I'm new in this area of planning. And they said that Three Gargantas is a copy of Itaipu. They went there, they looked at it, they came back, they took pictures, and they, that's what they said. Eve also, except that in technological innovation, we have not made such progress as they have. But we have conservative policies regarding technologies. So our expectations are now with our machinery, our, our, our cameras, we want to take pictures and see what we can do. So these dynamics of technological innovation, how can we see, how we relate to this fuel policy that we have and the environmental impact. So in a meeting like this, one challenge to build alternatives that will benefit us depending on our capacity to understand what type of integration do we want, what kind of economic volumes do we want for our countries. But we must not forget the instrument that moves the economy, which is energy. And the part which is, I think that's our discussion here. We'll talk more about this later. I want to continue now with Gabriel, so he can tell us about the perspective of Uruguay and Salto Grande and see how you understand that role for one project, because as Enya said, depending on the project, the vision from each country will change. 
So how do you understand hydropower as a part of the mix and the transition in Uruguay? Well, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Salto Grande, I thank you for your invitation to share with you and to learn from you. My colleague was unable to come because of a busy schedule, so I'm here talking for both of us. Now, Salto Grande is a binational agency with the specificity that it acts as a single unit. We have one manager, and, what is, and that is a strength of ours. But first, I want to talk about hydropower. Hydropower in the region, and in, in Latin America, and especially in Argentina and in Uruguay, has a fundamental role. And perhaps I am biased, but I believe that hydro power stations have, believe, have allowed us to have power stability. They are the ones that give stability and safety to the grid. And that's not an opinion, it is a fact. Electrical systems that are interconnected between Argentina and Uruguay would not be able to, fo to work without hydropower stations. They give stability, and that is a value that is fundamental for energy and energy transition. But they also give sufficient flexibility to the systems for us to carry out our energy strategies. And that value is not paid for. It is an added value. And that is the most important value of hydropower stations. And when I talk to my colleagues from other countries, the same thing happens in their countries. I heard a colleague from the United States say that hydropower stations are the silent power uh, partner of the incorporation of non-conventional renewables in the region, and that's very interesting. And I also believe that hydropower stations are a fundamental tool for regional development. They truly are. So that is one of the things that I wanted to mention. Now, in relation to the energy mix, Salto Grande contributes about 40% of all energy in Uruguay and 4% from Argentina. And apart from giving resilience, flexibility, safety, and stability, it has allowed for the expansion of non-conventional renewables. And it provides a support for the system to to function. I think that that's the most important thing. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is that the energy transition, the first energy transition in Uruguay, was about decarbonizing the energy mix. Now it has 90% of renewables. And Santo Grande has a fundamental role in that because of what it contributes and because of how it incorporates non-conventional renewables. And then the second mission is to decarbonize the transport mix. And I believe that the, first, that the same thing will happen because it pertains to using electricity. We will use hydrogen. Hydrogen is produced based on electricity. And for that, we need stations and grids. If we have synthetic fuels, the same thing happens. So hydropower stations will have that fundamental role in providing a support for that second energy transition in this case, in the transport mix. And as an additional comment, I wanted to talk about the environmental aspect. I was looking at the 2022 energy balance of Uruguay, and I was looking at the primary sources. In renewable energies, it's 20%. And out of that 20%, close to 12 to 13% is water power. And then of the other 80 is 40% petrol. And then the rest is biomass and wood. So I'm talking about the environmental perspective, either in the 40% of biomass and wood and the 12% that is water power. So that's an outlook that we need to consider. Um, I don't know, Gaston, if I answered your question. Yes, that's perfect, because I have two perspectives from two central, um, central stations that 
have a similar overview, but they have very different realities because of the countries and because of their relationships. And some of the points that you're bringing up are relevant, not just for the sector, but also for the entire energy sector. When Enya, for example, was talking about the energy trilemma, because we need accessibility, but we also need social and environmental sustainability, and we also need energy safety. And we see, we need to see how all those things are connected. And you were talking about their importance in generation and decarbonization, but you were also talking about stability, flexibility, and about everything that it offers and for energy transitions. So if we take that as a starting point from the generation sector, I want to talk about the role of multi multinationals. And that's why, Cecilia, I want to know about the role of the IDB in the energy sector, and in particular in hydropower. Perfect. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Ahton. It is a pleasure to be here with you today with these distinguished panelists and distinguished moderator. Now, going back to your question, as Luis Ross, the bank representative, mentioned yesterday in the inauguration, one of the bank's objectives is to support the fight against climate change. And I discuss this topic because the energy sector has a key role in achieving this goal. The energy sector is responsible for 44% of the emissions of greenhouse effect gases at the global level. But as many of you know, Latin America and the Caribbean has the greenest se energy sector of the world. It is the region that has electricity generated with renewables um, that is the highest in the, in the world. 60% of all the energy produced in Latin America and the Caribbean comes from renewables, and hydropower is responsible for 47% of that generation. So it is a positive responsibility. And historically, hydropower has played a key role for the development of our countries with clean, affordable energy. Now, what are the perspectives of the sector in the region? Well, based on Olade's energy forecast, we expect that economic growth might demand an additional electricity generation of over 550 gigawatts by 2050. And out of those, 30 gigawatts will come from hydropower by 2030 and over 100 gigawatts by 2050. So. So, so you need to take stock of this. But apart from this hydropower that we forecast will be needed, we will also need to modernize and rehabilitate all hydropower centrals in existence. In 2020, the bank published a report about the needs of modernizing the hydropower centrals in Latin America and the Caribbean. And the report notes that out of the 200 gigawatts of installed hydropower, half of it is over 30 years old, and a third is over 40 years old. So we will require significant investment in order to rehabilitate or repower those stations. And we will require close to $33 million. And out of that, $5,000 million will have to be modernized. So we need to modernize close to 2 to 3 gigawatts of hydro power stations each year. So that's a great volume indeed. And as the figures show, both in new generation capacities and in modernization, we will have to do a lot of planning, a lot of coordination, and undoubtedly will require a lot of funds. Now, in terms of investment, we have been providing support for traditional investments, providing sovereign guarantees, which is a fundamental thing for us, and we have been 
working on this since the inception of the bank. We have been cooperating in, in obtaining these investments because we understand that it is essential to modernize hydropowers, but we also need to have sustainable hydropower potencies. So we are fully aware of the role that those investments play. And since 1960, we have funded $700,000 million in investment in hydro hydropower stations and a similar figure in technical cooperation. In the past 10 years, we have supported the construction of 425 megawatts and the modernization of 2,000 700 in Brazil, Haiti, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua, and we are currently working in the support of the modernization of 2.5 gigawatts with an investment of over $250 million with partners such as Alto Grande, Ande, which is here, and Dene. And last year, we approved $1.5 million in technical cooperation for hydropower stations. And one thing that we are immensely proud of is that the first operation of the bank that was approved in energy was in a hydropower station in 1962 when Akarai was built. And this station is over 50 years old. It has been in operation for over 50 years. And in 2018, we once again approved funds for this station, for its modernization. And we are currently working with Veronica, my colleague, and the Ande team so that they might complete this process of modernization. And we're doing something similar in Salto Grande. In Salto Grande, we provided support as the station was built. We provided funds for its construction. In 2012, we started providing technical support for the development of a strategic investment plan to be executed in 27 years for over $955 million. And in 2019, we approved stage one for the modernization of Salto Grande, which is being executed right now. So I feel at home when I go to Salto Grande. This year, actually, we approved a second operation, which will be part of the 2A stage of modernization for $150 million, in addition to a credit line for $800 million, that will allow us to provide support to Salto Grande in the subsequent stages of those 20-something years ahead of the strategic plan. So apart from these very specific supports that we offer with funding, we will need for the new generation and for the modernization to have the private sector participate and provide investments for these kinds of projects. So we will require financing mechanisms that provide incentives for investments. A fundamental aspect that Gabriel mentioned is the need to establish new mechanisms that recognize all the different services provided by hydropower stations. These were called ancillary services, and now they are essential services, which will undoubtedly be necessary to get investments from the private sector. Now, on the other hand, we have the global commitment for decarbonization, and the private sector is also looking to make investments in clean energies. And in order to mobilize this capital, a key aspect will be to provide information that is reliable about climate risks and about energy transition opportunities in the operation of hydropower stations. <laughs> And an element for support can be climate financing 
that in the case of the modernization of hydropower stations, they are eligible for those financings based on the climate bond initiative. If the investors see that there's a lot of risk regarding hydropower projects, uh, we have to look at the they will start looking for other projects that are simpler and that require less investment and are less risky. So we must identify the risks that the private sector is perceiving when they invest in these types of projects and that the governments must also act to promote mitigation mechanisms and to reduce risks in order to attract investments. According to studies, most of the risks that are identified in the private sector are related to reputational risk, especially those that have to do with social and environmental issues. And another risk that is perceived is the non-repayment <coughs> or delays in construction processes and the building of new centrals. So it is necessary to work on reducing these risks. First identify them and then reduce them and attract these investments that will be very necessary to accompany the energy transition in a sustainable way in the region. Thank you, Cecilia. Looking at the figures that you mentioned, these are huge figures, 33 million dollars of investment, 5,000 in the next years. These figures show us the need. And an entity such as the bank is playing this role, but we need other actors, other players that accompany that effort that you're doing. And what you said, you, you mentioned new centrals, but also modernization of existing ones. And that's exactly what was being done with funding for Salto Grande. Uh, many times when we see all the efforts for financing, we have the technical counterpart that's implementing this, and we ask them to tell us how they're doing this. So you need to have two sides of the coin in the same conference. So I'm going to ask Gabriel to tell us about his experience on that process that they're carrying out with the financing of IDB. Tell us how you're structuring this, how you are carrying this out and executing this, and what are the next steps that you see for Salto Grande? Very well. That's a, a direct replica. You started being the one who pushed the project forward at the beginning. We have the whole team of Salto Grande here to give us this response. Yes, Salto Grande started with a renewal. Uh, we started some, with some funding of IDB. And they approved the start of the funding. But to tell you this quickly, the renovation program is something that was implemented in three stages. It was, I'll tell you how it was planned. It was the first stage was in 2024 in the execution, $80 million with the funding from IDB. We had a lot of contact with IDB. We learned a lot. It was an excellent experience. It was very difficult at first, but we learned a lot and we're very happy with that. The second stage, was in 2023 to 2029, also financing from the bank. It was approved by the board of IDB, $75 million with the cliff uh, financing. We called, then we had the stage three with the hydro generators. This is a process, it's a learning process. It was very difficult at first to, to learn about this and to create our internal team. We, we had to construct this 
these facilities. So we have a process of production and transportation of energy. And of course, we need to have the response of the market. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. And after these three stages, when we finish with stage three, we're going to have to start again with another stage. So we have to learn from the market, from bilateral agencies. We need to have that capacity to adapt and to think that it's a process that started, but it's here to stay. And we have to make this part of our daily lives. I'm very happy working with the bank. We receive support in all aspects from the bank. We have learned a lot. So it was a great experience. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. It's good that you ratified everything that was said before. At some point, I was wondering what will happen if he doesn't ratify the same things? But it was good. As I said at the beginning, we have the chance to celebrate 50 years with Olave. And Salto Grande started in 1979, I believe. You were like 40, 45 years old. You started in 1984, if I'm not mistaken. And you're celebrating 50 years of the uh, Itaipu Agreement. So please tell us, what were the main challenges that you had in your agenda? What were the main milestones that you had, the main achievements? Because we want to know the importance of these projects regarding regional integration. Part of the objectives that we have in Olave are to work in cooperation, to work on integration, energy security, and a great example of this are these projects. So as we are celebrating 50 years this year, maybe you can share some milestones and some of the challenges you, that you had to overcome and tell us how you in the future years and that binational agreement that you have with Paraguay. These 50 years, what I can say, the change, changing of experiences, 50 years of great success. I never talk about the application of the Project of Society B, and we learn every day, but co-living between Paraguay and Brazil, it's like a marriage. A marriage, but you don't have the right to divorce. We, we learn. As years go by, we learn how to live together and live together well. And I should highlight that we are co-living very well. We have 204 million inhabitants against a country with 6 million inhabitants. We have a lot of economic and social differences, but both countries went through political problems and economic problems. So if you look at the history of Brazil and Paraguay, uh, everything, a lot of things happened. Sometimes the pitch was first in Paraguay and then it was in Brazil. But then something important is happening. Fides was with us at dinner with the president. I don't remember if it was the vice president of Spain or France. I think it was Spain. We were talking and he asked us how do we live in Paraguay being a country that has a liberal background and representing a left-wing government and they responded that we don't have time to think about that. We are leading a central that is facing difficulties and we have challenges so the great method of the 50 years was to learn how to live together. And Itapu, Itaipu has two evolutions. One is the scientific evolution. 50 years ago, to build a structure like this, there was no software. We didn't have scientific calculators 50 years ago. This is a great revolution. But we also have the integration revolution, the integration of these two countries. This is very important, where we 
today are updating technology because there's a central and a big part of us are working on that. It's a project that has started 14 years ago and we need another 14 years to finish it. And again, when we finish it, we will start again, as you just said. Exactly, because you never finish with technological advances. And so there has to be a very big technology update. We have in Aitaipu an agreement on environmental impacts and there's a historical commitment in our agreement and there's a note of 2015. So a lot of the resources of Itaipu in Brazil and Paraguay, because resources are shared 50-50, these are for environmental policies that these are very big environmental policies. They're integrated. We also have the UN also that presents characteristics at a global level, social characteristics, another important thing. And also in January this year, given the negotiations of tariffs and rates, this is normal in any alliance. Brazil consumes all its 50% of energy and Paraguay still doesn't consume all its energy, the energy it has a right to. Why? So it sells to Brazil. So all year round we have a great challenge because Paraguay sells energy to Brazil and they want to have a higher rate, the highest rate possible. But Brazil, as it consumes all its energy, wants a lower rate, as low as possible. And that's where we have a rivalry. But we do have negotiations. They start in August every year. And when everything is in agreement, we close the agreement. If we can, we close in April. Otherwise, we close in December. We are always working on this. So this year, 2023, with the negotiated rate, we can have a, a rate that will allow us to look at our capacity not only updating the maintenance of the central, but also other needs. We can also update our uh, environmental and social policies. Now, where are we headed within this project? Now, we have a very big challenge, which is to expand our production capacity. Today, the discussion is around this issue. But Itaipu, in the case of Brazil, it's the third lowest price in Brazil. While some private sectors say that our energy is expensive, we could prove that from 2021 until 2023, we only increased 26% in the rate. It's very little. So that 26% of increase, in average, we have an adequate price for the country. But we could expand our production, not our hydropower, but we can use our structure to produce photovoltaic. So we have made a lot of progress in binationally. We have a very important project to use the water of the centrals to use photovoltaic energy. So we hope to have a leap in our production of energy, have more affordable energy and so everybody's moving forward. We are seeing, we are using this other alternative. We are just speculating for now regarding figures, but we're talking about 10 to 20 percent of what Itaipu is to produce energy. That is our expectation. Also, the projections of the technicians with this project. So the idea that we can increase the capacity in Brazil in a specific manner of those alternative energies that have grown a lot. 60 days ago, we had a blackout in the state of Ceará. Energy dropped and our country was without energy for four hours in that region. Of course, Itaipu starts producing in those hours. So that day, 27% of the energy that was produced was wind and photovoltaic. So it grew a lot in Brazil. That production grew a lot in Brazil. And that 
increase the importance of Itaipu for Brazil because 12 years ago, Itaipu was 22% of electric energy produced in our country, but now it's 9%. So the country grew. We produce the same, but the country increased its demand for energy. Also, the role of Itaipu changed. Itaipu today is it has a great capacity for the country. And when we don't have sun, for example, who can ensure us to have energy in Brazil? It's Itaipu. So today, we have more strategic importance for the development in Brazil than we had before. It's important to highlight this. So it takes 20 minutes, for example, for us to increase production. One day from 8 in the morning until 7 in the afternoon, we increase production 104%. For one, we could do that in one day. And that is a challenge. That first, to maintain technological innovation, expand our production of energy, and also clean and affordable energy com to be competitive, and we went from having our very strong environmental policies. We acknowledge that Itaipu has a fundamental role on the border of Brazil to ensure a firm production against the volatility of those other alternatives. These are important. These are affordable and necessary. And normally, our technicians exemplify this with a glass of alternatives. They come up to here on the glass. But who can ensure that the glass is always full? That's energy from its hydropower. This can ensure these characteristics. And its, in, and its importance is increasing every day more. So increasing our production is very important. In Itaipu, there's no place for discussing this. We can't think about anything else. Because the environmental limits that we have, that's our challenge. And finally, the great challenge that we have in Itaipu, which is our mission, is integration. Integration, this concept was expanded after August 15 with President Santiago Peña. Lula had already taken office in January, so that perspective of integration was very important. So, given the same academy, academic um, instances, we are presenting now that Itaipu has within its physical environment in Brazil a federal university. It's called MILA. It's a um, Latin American integration university. And it was thought to have a university to train leaders for Mercosur, technicians for Mercosur, but in the end it was only for Brazil. And now, given the decision of President Lula and Peña, now it will be the first binational university of the world. And we will start organizing there, and there physically, where it's established, we will start discussing in our education for both countries with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs a new agreement because the Itaipu agreement does not have this within it. Uh, also, as solar energy is a new agreement, an agreement where we can see this university with both countries trying to create technical capacities, leaders for both countries for our main topic, which is energy. So right now, we have a very strong movement to reflect, understand our errors and, our, and what we have done correctly. But we have to look at the future, but looking at the reality. We cannot think about the future thinking that nothing can change, that everything will remain the same. The only thing that is certain is that nothing will remain the same. It's a dynamic. We understand the role that we all play. And that's where we need to have ongoing updating of technology, also keep training the workforce, also look at adaptation, adapting to new needs. And this is our concern with the university, with photovoltaic energy, with research of the technological park, 
we have a very large technological park. Um, it's been 20 years now since we've been exploring all different possibilities of uh, production of new metals. So we understand that dynamic of society and we can move forward with this. And to close, that vision today has a deadline. We have a reservoir of 124 hours. We are having a policy, an intense policy to expand that because that's the lifetime of Itaipu. If we can advance in the policies and we advance that time, we will be able to have technological advances and see and have Itaipu for 300 years. And that's what we want. Apart from the 50-year celebration, we want even more for Brazil and also for Paraguay. Thank you for all of that information about everything that you did, about the challenges that you face, especially when we have this relationship between a country that is buying and another that is selling, and about how you have to be constantly negotiation, negotiating without interruption. You said this is a marriage that cannot be dissolved. And you also told us about your perspective and about how you can create space to think not just about the generation of electricity, but also about including a binational university that might help you strengthen bonds with other aspects, not just with the generation of electricity, but also by incorporating education and new technologies solar energy so that you might keep the level as high as possible injecting solar energy to use it as a reservoir as you mentioned in terms of energy efficiency all of the things that you mentioned make this very appealing However, you were saying we were at 22%, and if we're at 22% and that percentage drops, and we look at other countries in the region, Argentina is in the same situation. I imagine Uruguay is in that situation as well. And based on that, the question that arises is how can we revert this situation? and relaunch the growth of hydroelectricity so that it's not just about maintaining the installed power, but also it's about keeping the curve. What strategies could we implement at the regional level so that it's not just about keeping up with the installed power, but also moving forward doing maintenance, as Cecilia mentioned. She said that we needed 30 gigawatts by 2030. So how can we start moving towards reaching that goal of 30 gigawatts in the next seven years? Well, first, we should have these events. They are fundamental because it's a space where we can share ideas. Everything that we say this week will be fundamental. Another basic thing that I was talking about with Cecilia is that we need to update the existing stations and we need to also start talking about smart hydropower stations that will allow us to adapt to the changes in the energy sector and in, in change of climates. The market roles are changing, the demand is changing. We are now facing more extreme, severe climate events and we need to adapt in that sense. So we need to change, maintain, update and leverage what we have when we can make changes to increase our capacity. We need to assess them and evaluate them. We had some ideas and we discarded them due to market reasons. 
and we rolled them out because we considered that they were not beneficial for the country. If we only consider some investments in hydropower stations at the market level, yes, we're going to rule them out. But when we think about them in terms of a benefit for the country, we shouldn't rule them out and we shouldn't lose sight of that, right? Hydropower stations have a multiplying effect by 10, by per, per dollar that we spend in, in Salto Grande, we are saving 10. So the return on investment is very long, but at the country level, the investment is beneficial. So our hydroelectrical capacities need to be updated in as much as possible, when we can and how we can. And then we also need to improve energy integration. Now we have all the grids available, and many times we don't use the hydroelectrical stations in the way that we should. We are the smallest station, but the other ones have grids that are integrated and we're not exchanging power. So in the short term, we should try to exchange information and the surplus. That's the first thing that we should do. And I think that that will be the element that will pull in other changes. So that's my first humble contribution in this area. Can you hear me? No? Thank you. I would add something that I spoke to Aston about yesterday is that we need to talk about sustainability and about the perception of hydropower stations, both new hydropower stations as well as the modernization of hydropower stations can be done within a sustainability framework, both social, environmental, and financial perspective. And we need to move towards that. I think that that's fundamental, and that's something that investors were mentioning as a limit, uh, as a limitation. They understood that in new hydropower station projects, they saw risks in terms of the possible changes for societies and for environment that might affect their own companies. So I think we should have more efficient hydropower stations. And they should be more environmentally responsible. And if they are, they will obtain the funding they need. For example, the bank only provides funds for the projects that comply with the framework of social and political and environmental policies of the bank. And there are things that they must comply with. They need to carry out a social and environmental performance analysis for the projects. The projects need to promote the financial growth by creating high quality job positions. They must undoubtedly make an efficient use of resources available. They must reduce impact to communities and minimize the involuntary resettlement of peoples. They need to focus on the conservation of cultural heritage and natural resources and promote gender equality and the participation of all stakeholders. We truly believe that the projects that follow these guidelines have a much better performance than those which don't. At the level of hydropower stations, there is a hydropower station sustainability certificate. And you can obtain that certificate in the different stages. If you are under construction, you can get a certificate during that stage. During operation, during modernization, you can get a certificate. And that helps showcase how that station is performing in terms of sustainability, environment, and social matters. And this is aligned with the environmental and social framework of the bank. 
and that I think is highly important in order to promote the creation of new stations. Well, thank you. So let us try to summarize this to wrap up the panel. If I consider everything you all mentioned, in order to arrive at a conclusion, I think there are four or five words that can summarize this. We spoke about funding, which is a very important aspect of this. But then you spoke about communication and dialogue, and that includes topics such as having spaces like this one to help disseminate information. You also spoke about the image of the stations, and you spoke about environmental and social sustainability, and how that is also incorporated with skills and providing training. And then we go back to what Inyo said about having universities, such as the Binational University, and how important it is. And then we also talk about diversity, inclusion, and gender. So with these words of f funding, communication, and sustainability, including the certificate within the concept of environmental sustainability, we can find access for the work towards the future of hydropower. Now, before we conclude and we give you a space for questions, I wanted to apologize on behalf of Guillaume Alellini, Chief of Staff of Olade, who, given personal reasons, he was unable to moderate the panel. So I want to send you his greetings. Now, before we conclude with the panel, if you have any questions, now is the time. The interpreter apologizes, but cannot hear the speaker. Gracias. In generating waste throughout the process, because maybe there is material that comes from the dams that can be recycled. Did you calculate what percentage could be saved in the primary project or in the 2050 project using new technologies as well as the AI technologies? It's a good question, right? Maybe you don't have an answer. That's a good question. Uh, maybe I need to write your phone number down and then answer. <laughs> uh, so from our experience, I think the most similar thing is digitalization. That's a strong suit in Salto Grande. And by digitalization, we understand it is the most potent tool that we have to promote sustainability in our renovation programs. This will lead to operational efficiency because we can make decisions in real time. It can allow us to better manage data. It improves processes. And mostly, it allows us to tackle sustainability from a holistic point of view, and that's the best tool we have available to us. If someone could please give a microphone to the colleague over there. Well, esteemed Gen Director General Enyane Barri, it's a pleasure to hear you. And to all the panelists, I wanted to thank you for the excellent panel. You provided us with a lot of information. And we're currently working on trying to modernize the Karabi station, and it's fundamental for us to do this. And I just wanted to highlight that building this station was the starting point for the regional integration. Because in order for the Akarae station 
being feasible, at the beginning, Paraguay only had 10 megawatts of demand, and the central had 90 megawatts. So it had 10 times the generation capacity than the demand. So in order for the station to be feasible, we had to conduct that integration. And we started selling energy from Acaray to Copel in Brazil. And we also sold energy to Argentina in the Misiones province. So binational stations represent integration among our regions, mainly for Paraguay, because it's integrated with its neighboring countries. And I also wanted to highlight what the general director Inyo Mary mentioned, which is that Itaipu, and I say this as a mem as a president of the Ande and as a member of the Electrical Committee, I can confirm that Itaipu is an example of integration at the global level because it not only allows us to integrate our electrical systems, but also allows us to integrate our cultures. We integrate our staff. It is something worth noting, and I think it should be emulated at the global level. What we represent, what Itaipu represents for Brazil and Uruguay and Paraguay should be emulated. There are multiple projects that are ongoing, as the director mentioned. And I am sure that that proper integration between Paraguayans and Brazilians is worth noting. And one thing that is worth noting is that the debt was paid in full in a timely manner. And that's important because regardless of the hardships faced by the countries in the past 50 years, we were always able to go beyond the internal issues of our countries in order to, com to comply with our financial commitments. And in the in present, Itaipu has no debts for the construction of this binational station. So once again, esteemed director, I want to highlight that we are going through the best moment between our countries. And this beautiful relationship that we have will enable us to have 50 more successful years through the binational Itaipu. Thank you. Very well. Let's give the floor to our colleague, and then we can close the session. This is like the airlines. They are a little bit delayed when they leave an airport, but they arrive on time at their destination. Thank you. First of all, I wish to thank Thank you for this wonderful panel. I would like to reflect on something, and I would like to ask your opinion on this. It's about the role in the energy transition of the reversible hydropower. We've seen great investments and objectives of renewals in the next years for 2030, 2050. How do you see the pumping in this renovation the pumping in this new hydropower to be developed? Because in my opinion, it's essential for flexibility mechanisms, for the new business models that allow transition. And it's very relevant. So I would like to, sh to have your opinions on this. Thank you. Whoever wishes to speak. You have the floor. OK. I've been in some events where this has been discussed. And as we said, hydropower, I'm going to say something which is, without hydropower and transition, we don't have integration. It's a reality. 
without transmission and hydro power, there is no transition possible. And with technology, the pumping stations, the reversible, are options to be considered. Depends on the country, the market, and the possibilities. It's very interesting. The same way that we need to expand transportation of energy, hydropowers must be expanded, and we must include this for pumping also. Thank you. Very well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to the panelists. For me, this was wonderful, sharing this panel with you. You shared all your knowledge with the audience. It was a real pleasure and an honor to have shared this panel with you. So thank you very much for your participation. Very well, we close the session. Thank you.